Hello, everyone. This is another Freedom to Feel conversation. And my guest today is Stephen W. Wilson. So Stephen is a 74, five and a half, actually almost 75 years old now, married for 50 years, has three granddaughters, two great granddaughters, and he's retired from custom clothing business in 2019. He was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in 1978. Stephen now facilitates two mental health support groups in Phoenix. So he wrote the memoir, Teetering on a Tight Rope, My Bipolar Disorder. That was released in 2022. Well, he wrote it in 2022. It's available on Amazon. So I guess my open question uh, for you, Stephen, is how would you introduce yourself today in, in this moment? This is the bio that I received, but who is Steve as of now? Well, I would say the, the most direct answer is I'm a survivor. Um, I actually began my journey in 1958 uh, when I was sexually assaulted at a movie theater. Yeah. And that became apparent that something was wrong after that when I went into a deep depression about two or three months later right. and that started everything. Now, if you want to understand bipolar, you have to realize that it comes and goes. It isn't all day, every day. So you can have some good times and you're going to have a lot of bad times and it is a long journey. There is no cure for bipolar, but there's a lot of help out there. If you follow the regimen that is set forth for you, you can have a decent life, maybe even a good life. Um, but if you don't follow what they tell you, it's going to be even worse. Mm. Wow. And that is, uh, we talked off record briefly, and I also read that in your book, uh, Teetering on a Tightrope at the end. You talk about um, this unfortunate, sad, really, um, idea for some people that mental illnesses, they are not supposed to be seen. So there's a lot of shame and people try to hide the way they feel and they think. So what is your message for those with... Um, uh, ch with this challenge at this moment with mental, any kind of mental health, depression, anxiety, what would you tell them? Well, the first thing you have to do is tell yourself that you believe something is wrong. Mm. Don't try to hide it from yourself. Agree that you need help. Um, Right now in the United States and around the world, 20% of the populations suffer from some kind of mental illness. Yeah. That's a lot of people and they suffer every day. In the United States, 20% of teenagers also are going through some mental health issues and the suicide rate Teenagers group. Unfortunately, around the world, governments, society don't really recognize the problem as much as they do things like cancer, MS, and so on, heart disease. They kind of want to shuffle it under the uh, table mm. and let it go. Um, there's a attempt in most states to have a system. Um, the one here in Arizona is called uh, Access. And Access allows you, if you can get qualified by going on Social Security Disability, to connect with clinics uh, throughout the states here in Arizona, we've got a, a decent uh, channel of, of help for people. Yeah. But people who are financially okay 
and can get help on their own if they want to accept the fact that they need it they can get it without any problem but if you're lower middle income or lower income or in poverty good luck because the system is broken people can't get help and you ask yourself how do i know this because i'm not a mental health professional i have these two groups that mental health support that i uh, facilitate the people tell me what they're going through and it is horrific Wow. Uh, that's not good news in a way. But um, why do you think that is, that the government is not helping? My own opinion is uh, so many people in our country and around the world just kind of, they can't see it in people. Yeah. And people are not coming forward because they're ashamed that they have something wrong with them mentally. So the government doesn't really notice that it's such a bad problem. Shame on them. Because I can tell you that uh, 20% of the population is a huge number. Yeah. But they, they keep sweeping it under the rug. Um, and, and they only think uh, that uh, the the health system is geared better for physical diseases, attack, so on. Um, so it's just kind of left on its own, and it is really a bad system. And then on top of that, to make matters worse, the insurance companies won't insure or don't or only insure up to a point. Right. Uh, when I was a young man, uh, I got my first uh, uh, life insurance policy when I was about 25. And right on the first page, it said, we do not cover any mental illnesses. Wow. Now, that was 1973 or four. Right. Uh, I tell you what I did, I lied because I needed the uh, the normal insurance coverage, even though at that time I was at my worst mentally, but they weren't going to help me at all. So and it's just got been the same all these years. That's really sad to hear. I actually am not in um, updated with this situation and that's good that to hear that from you because you're closer to this whole um let's say uh establishment that's the system isn't it so it, it leaves us with the opportunity to take care for ourselves to look after ourselves which is not easy for people with mental health issues because they don't recognize that they have a problem a lot of times well even if they recognize they have a problem Sometimes they're just thinking they better deal with it on their mm, own yes. or they don't want anybody giving a medication for whatever reason they seek not to help professional help. And believe uh -huh. me, that's the worst thing you can do because you can get better if you get help. Right. So with that in mind, I guess the question to ask you now is how do we recognize when we have actually a serious, it's, mental health issues that's going unrecognized and untreated. What are the symptoms? How do we get to that conclusion? Well, in my case, um, again, I started getting really bad in 1958. That's a long time ago. And there was, to my knowledge, not a lot of help. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what these, the uh, psychiatrists, what they were how well aware they were at that time. Right. But uh, all I knew is that something was wrong. I was feeling worthless, uh, a loser. I had no, I thought I had no friends. I thought my parents didn't love me anymore. I didn't want to get out of bed. I couldn't sleep at night. So 
that went on and on and then it then it leveled out and got better for a few months but back then i had nowhere to turn my parents didn't understand what was going on no fault of their own but they had no idea and so i sat in front of the television staring at the boob tube for hours on end not doing homework not playing uh and not knowing what, what was wrong. Today, from my groups, I can tell you that it's still going on that way. Um, when I was diagnosed first, uh, 20 years after my sexual assault, they diagnosed me as clinically depressed. And they had some drugs back then for depression, but not many. Right. None of them worked. They all made me sick or they stimulated me so much that I couldn't control myself. And I went through that for eight years. It was horrible. And then in 1978, my psychiatrist came in and said, I think I made a mistake. You're bipolar. Oh. It meant nothing to me. I never heard of bipolar. Right. But what happened was he prescribed lithium, which was a wonder drug, and I got better. I was able, I got about 50% better overnight, and I was able to function again. Not nearly perfect, but I was able to get my life back. And for the next, let's see, that was 78, for the next about 20 years, I was kind of like in a state of 50% good, 50% bad. And had, still had a lot of good times. I, I was married, had three kids and so on. Uh, but I had a lot of bad times too. Right. Oh, my God, Stephen. Yeah, I'm really sorry for what you went through. Um, you. Reading your story is just like it breaks my heart. And I'm, uh, yeah, it just made me just stop. And um, I cried. And then I was just reflecting about the human condition, how bad it can get, uh, how abusive humans sometimes can be with one another. Well, I tell you, these people who are abusing others, and especially kids, yeah, they right. get their pleasure out of it for whatever they need. But they ruin the person's life. It never is the same again. Right, right. And I came up in a pretty well-to-do family. Had everything anybody could wish for. But it didn't make any damn difference. The damage was done. So if there is one uh, message that you could send to people in general, would you send a message to parents as well? Like even school teachers, how can we change the way we um, educate, the way we interact with our own children and teach them how to be more love and kind to other people. Is that something that you feel that's missing, more kindness? I definitely do. Uh, I think it's better than it was now that the word is trickling out about mental health issues in teenagers. But most of our parents are not educated about what their kid is going through. And also the kid is hiding it. Yes. It's very different to yes. pick up the signals of what's going on. Now they'll tell you in news ads and so on TV, oh, if he's sleeping too much or, or uh, he seems like he's down, you ought to get help. Well, kids fake it so much that their parents don't have a clue. And in the schools, the schools are getting better, but uh, they don't recognize very often until it's too late what a kid is going through. I had one teacher once tell me as I, I also, up until moving to Arizona, was speaking to high school health and uh, psychology classes about uh, teenage depression, and I gave a talk to a seventh grade class. I did the whole day, so I did about seven talks, and it was their day for mental health discussions, and I went to the teacher, 
and she really didn't like my presentation. She thought it was too down and dirty because I talked about suicide. Yeah. And then I said to her, uh, how often do you talk to your students about this? She says, once a year. I said, well, well, hell, that doesn't help anybody. I mean, it's nice to do it one time, but they got this condition 365 days a year. Why don't you talk to them more? And she says, well, we don't want to scare them. Oh. And I thought, my God. So that's what we're faced with. So we were finding resistance, yeah, from schools, from teachers as well, not to talk about certain things. And that's the antidote, really, education, knowledge to ignorance. We Absolutely. need right, to learn to speak about these things openly. So I want to thank you again for doing that, for openly talking about what you went through and then putting this message out there. It's truly beautiful, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. I got to thank you. Like I'll thank you about 10 times throughout the interview. <laughs> um, <laughs> so another question is, did you set an intention when you wrote the book? What is the main purpose and intention of writing your book? Did you have one? Well, I'll tell you, um, in about the year 2000, I got to be put on Paxil because I was ruminating so much, which is my mind would just go on and on and on about the same thing. And I couldn't close it off. Yeah. That's what I went through mostly for those 20 years. That was the worst thing. But a new psychiatrist put me on Paxil and almost all of that went away. So that was 2000 and we moved to Scottsdale in 2008. And I was still having uh, major regrets, problems that really bugged the hell out of me. Yeah. A, uh, and so I decided I got to get rid of this too. So in about 2018 or 19, I went to a trauma therapist. And she said, we're going to take you throughout your life, starting with your earliest memory and go into everything. Chronological order. So we did this for several months. And it was great. It really worked. Uh, and at the end of it, she said, damn, you ought to write a book about it. <laughs> yes. And so I had once been a sports writer. And so I was familiar with writing a little bit. And uh, I said, well, let's give it a shot. And I did. It was fairly easy, but it was a long process because going through my life, I knew everything and I was going to say, but right. I learned to write too. You can't just put it down. Yes. So I did. But I did it mostly to get the word out and to get rid of the stigma against mental health. I'm not going to make any money off this book. That's that's tough. That's really tough. Um, but I did it for that reason. And if somebody reads my book, they'll notice that one of the things throughout the book is that if you really try, you can beat this thing. And that's why I wrote it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a beautiful, beautiful intention, though, to help other people to heal themselves as well. Um, did you find the process of writing uh, challenging in a sense of uh, writing about certain stories? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, it took about maybe a year to write the book. But as I said, I didn't have to do any research because it was all in my head. So the, the problem, the real problem was writing it so it would flow well and people would enjoy reading it and it would be a fast read. The real problem is getting it published. Mm, yeah. it took two years. Right. And I had to self-publish, which I'll never do again. Um, it is expensive and my book sales for the amount of money I put in it are not that good. So I will never, I'm writing, I'm started on another book. Oh, you are. Yeah. Yes. Uh, 
but I won't do it self published. If I, if no publisher takes it up, well then I'll never, I'll never do it. Mm. Okay. Since now you made me curious, what is the next book about? <laughs> if you can disclose a bit of the topic. Well, I've just started on it and it is about what I learned through having written the first book and going through trauma therapy. Yes. And as I said, I just started, I haven't really gotten into it too much, but uh, it's going to take an, another year to write it. Yes. Uh, it'll be about the same length, I think, 100 pages or so. So it's an easy read, two, two to three hours. Right. But uh, it's going to be more difficult for me because well, I've learned a lot of things about what I went through and how I dealt with them. This is different because uh, I have to put it in such a way that it shows the impact of what my thoughts are now about having gone through 50, 60 years of bipolar disorder. Right. Wow. That would be an interesting read too. But what fascinates me the most, it's your openness to go deeper into healing, continue to do that for yourself and help others. It's just so incredibly beautiful to see that. Well, thank you. I, I'm very disappointed in the book sales, although I have offset that with doing a bunch of podcasts. Yeah. And the more people hear about it, I mean, they don't buy the book, they don't buy the book. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'm getting the word out slowly. I've done about 25 podcasts so far. Yes. So that's the route I'm taking now. Yeah, it, that really helps. And some people say that if you can help one person, then it is. I did my work. And I, I know that this is not the case for most of us. I write books myself, too. And I know we need to make a living a lot of time as an author. Some people who only do that. So we got to find strategies to get the book yes. sold and all that. And one of these strategies is one that you are applying right now, doing podcasts and being out there. The more you're out there, the better it is. That's how it works in the very beginning, of course. And if you get to go to, to, on TV, then it's when it really takes off. But yes. that's a different yeah, platform. <laughs> it's, it's a long-term project, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, it's possible. Very much possible. Um, another question that came to me to, uh, yeah, that I wanted to ask you, Steve, is about the the importance of support. So talk to me about your wife and your kids and people around you and how important were they in, on your journey with bipolar? Well, in the beginning, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, I really had no support. Um, back then, you didn't talk about mental illness at all. Right. And if you got caught up in the system somehow, more often than you would expect, they put them in uh, institutions, which did very little other than to get them off the streets. Right. Which was probably the worst thing they could have done. So for those first 20 years, I kept it quiet. I was uh, able to hide behind a mask and I was one of the class clowns and looked like I was having a great time. Yeah. Had a lot of friends, was in sports. I did everything like that. And then when I went home, I crashed. My parents, well, my mother, my father did nothing. He, he, he was worthless. But my mother recognized that something was not right uh, in the early 70s and got me a psychiatrist that she had gone to. And that's why she recognized I was having troubles. So that was a blessing. Right. And that's when I got help. Yeah. Most of my help came from my wife uh, when I needed it. Um, I'd done some things before we got married that were bad. And she, we got married in 72 and she's been with me all these years. She's now been 51 years. Yes. Um, she doesn't cuddle me or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. She just keeps me honest and in a good place. 
Mm. <laughs> yes, I can imagine. <laughs> That's beautiful to see. Um, you see, to see that support, to see um, men and women, not just, uh, although I do find women to be more compassionate and kind towards. <laughs> There's no question. <laughs> right? There's something about that, which is, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm biased for being a woman, but. I do see that even with my husband, you know, kind of really asking him to take care of, take more care of himself that he sometimes he doesn't. You know, men were brought up never to cry, never yeah. to show emotion. And it was always that way. Yeah. That has changed yes. over the last 20 years or so. And I see a lot of men uh, coming to my groups. I bet it's 50-50 now. Yeah. And really bearing their their souls and telling us what's going on. Wonderful. So that's changing. That's that's yes. that's evolution uh in that area. Another question I have for you uh, was about the another yeah. So some people they like I do see the importance of medication. I know that for some in some cases it's it's a must because they can't really help themselves. Uh, and in those disorders, they don't go away. But I also do feel that a lot of um, our problems has to do with um, the lack of self-knowledge, not understanding the mind, how it works, and getting deeper into all the aspects of what it is to be a human being. And in my case, has been spirituality. I've been through a lot of traumas myself too, in childhood, abuse and all that. But spirituality has been like the, the door <laughs> to a lot of beautiful things and greatness when it comes to healing as well. Mm -hmm. So I would love for you to talk to me for a moment about something that I read at the end of your book about um, the idea of God. I know you had some, you went through some experiences that made you in a way believe. <laughs> you say in the end, you say, I don't believe in God, but I acknowledge there is a possibility that he exists. <laughs> so talk to me about your ideas as of today of spirituality and what is out there that we call God. I usually don't use the word God. I use life, the universe, but I would love <laughs> to hear from you. <laughs> well, I was brought up a Christian, uh, yeah. believed in God, uh, believed in heaven and hell, and didn't change those beliefs until I was in my 20s and, and I was at my worst with bipolar. I had no medication at that time. I was on the road, meaning I was selling my stuff. At that time, it happened to be suits, sport coats, and slacks to stores around Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan. So I was by myself and I would stay in a different hotel every night. And I mean, I was really bad. Aye. So every night I would get the Bible and get it out, turn to the Psalms and beg for help. Well, this went on for months. And at the same time, the world was exploding like it is today. Nothing was being done about the Cold War and all those things that were going on Vietnam. Yeah. Everything was bad. And so one day I was in my room late at night and I just threw the book, Bible down and said, you're not going to help me. You don't give a damn about anybody, even if you're there. So I no longer believe in you. God, I was talking about. Yeah. And that's exactly what I did. I threw him out, have never, ever regretted it, because in my belief now, I don't believe in any of the stories, I'll call them in the Bible anymore, because I believe that they are just that, stories, just like today. People write books, and I have never, ever seen uh, a time when the world was peaceful, hmm. loving, and you know, you think of God as being that way, but it's not true in my mind. So what happened was to change, a little, I, be, I was an atheist for seven years, 
40 years. Well, I changed to become an agnostic, which means that I don't believe in God or spirituality, anything like that. But some things happened over my life that were unexplainable and worked out for the good. So I changed my mind and said, well, maybe there's a possibility. That's all I did. That maybe become an agnostic. Um, but I'm really, I'm still more atheist than anything else. It's funny. Um, last week in one of my groups, and we never speak about two things, religion and politics. Mm, yeah. Well, religion came up and this one guy did what we're never supposed to do. And he talked about how Jesus and God will save everybody. And if you believe in him, all your worries will go over. Well, you know what's funny about it? I know this guy I've known him for two or three years. He's as sick as anybody else mentally. So it isn't doing him any good. And the person he was directing this to was having a dilemma in his life about whether there is a God or not. Hey. But in my groups, we're not allowed to tell anybody what to do. Hey. So, so this guy who was ranting on about God and his powers was way over the line. So I had to stop it. And it took away about 15 minutes of our two hour discussion. So, you know, a lot of people who want to hear about God and his powers, there are exactly as many people in my groups who don't want anything to do with it. Mm. So it's a taboo uh, talk. When it comes up, I shut it down every time. Yes, um, and I understand because... Um... It's almost like seems like it's another trauma. I, I have had that experience myself too, suffering when I was a child and asking God for help um, for probably months or years and never really happened until I realized, wait a minute, I got to do something about my own life. I have That's to change right. myself. <laughs> and what about if God is, it's us, it's in us, it's doing everything. It's here right now, acting as you, me and everything, everyone else. Um, that kind of, it's the idea that comes to me as the closest, the closest thing to the truth. What about if God, it's everyone, it's everything. And so we are not looking for God for help. We just help ourselves and that might change everything. Well, that is exactly right. I, you know, a minute ago, you talked about medications just briefly. Yeah, yeah. And I want to tell you that one of my psychiatrists I went to, in fact, I was a trauma therapist yeah. a few years ago, admitted to me, and I've never heard this anyplace else, that medication designed for psychological problems only works about 50% of the time. Yeah. So that means that 50% of the people have to figure out a way to solve their problems and because medication doesn't help them. Not 100%, yes. No, not even close. Right. So there are a lot of uh, modalities you can use as a mental patient when the medication doesn't help to really get good help through therapy. Mm, yes. Yeah. One of the problems is there's EMDR, there's... Uh, uh, dialectical therapy uh there's there's a whole bunch of them there's intensive outpatient very few people know about them because if they don't go into yeah. uh therapy or a hospital or something else there's no way for them to know about it uh, i suppose if you get in a mental health magazine uh or another podcast that you can hear it. Yeah. Some people don't do that. So they struggle on their own and it's, it's really tough. I've heard of a lot of people getting so much help out of it. There's ketamine. There's a, yes. Therapy. 
There's all these things that can help you. Nobody knows about them. Uh, so that's why, yeah, on my podcast, we talk about everything. And I'm actually thinking about having categories. So we have all these, because I talked to a lot of therapists, I have tons of them with mm -hmm. different kinds of therapies. So maybe it's a good idea to um, get that on my website too, now that I'm speaking to you. I already have that in place, but maybe I got to make it easier in a way for people to find it. The alternative healing uh, modalities. Yes, definitely. Yeah. They are powerful. Um, what about diet? Did you change your lifestyle as well, Steve, in the sense of eating better? I have never been good about that. Yeah. I have <laughs> never paid any attention to it. Yeah. Um, most of my life, I drank a lot of caffeinated drinks and so on. And I know they weren't good for me. But the, the one thing I did in the 70s and 80s, I popped a lot of roll A's because I had a knot in my stomach that wouldn't go away. And that brings up something else. Mental illness is just is not just in your head. Mm. It transforms into mm. physical problem. Uh, diarrhea, inability to sleep, uh, aches and pains throughout your body. It it just works in ways you could never imagine. Right. Because everything's connected. Body, mind connection. Yes. yes. For sure. So healthy diet seems to, to help a lot of people. I've seen that. Sometimes they change their entire diet, more supplementation, vitamins. I think I remember a doctor in Canada, he used to do that supplementation. I think for bipolar, schizophrenia, different kinds of, he would give them a cocktail of vitamins and they mm -hmm. would get 50% better. Almost do the same what medication does. But what would the difference was that they would be much healthier overall so they would have a better heart their lungs everything would work better so that kind of caught my attention i remember that time i take my my supplements for that reason too like i remember, i see that i don't drink caffeine so I, I see clearly the connection between body mind so i'm always very very aware of that uh, what i eat when i was in the throes of really bad stuff no one ever mentioned that. Back then, there was no connection between diet and uh, mental health. It wasn't there, so I just never thought of it. Uh, and that said, exercise too. Do you exercise, Steve? Yes, I. that is a huge help. I yes. swam all yeah. my life, laps, 40 laps, 50 yeah. laps every day. I was a runner. I played tennis. Boy, all that stuff helped. Yes, yeah. Were you able to reduce um, the dosage, the medication dosage? No, never tried. I, you know, um, I'm still on the medications that I got in the 70s. Wow. I yeah. feel well enough that I'm not going to change to something else at this late stage in my life. Right. So the answer is no, kind of. Um, another question is, have you seen the side effects of those medications? Have you felt them? <laughs> yes, if you read the book, <laughs> you know I have. Um, the first drug I mentioned was lithium. Yes. They give you a warning uh, when you start on lithium that it could damage your kidney. So every six months or so, you have to get blood work. So I started on lithium in 1978 and discovered in the year around 2000 that I only had 50% usage of my kidney left. And it was all due to the lithium. Uh, that was around 2000 and it continually got worse too. In 2021, I had a kidney transplant. Yeah. Uh, so, and then another thing I had and still am on it because it had done its damage and was irreversible. I had a uh, uh, antipsychotic medication called theothixine I was on and still am. And it, like most other uh, antipsychotic medications, causes tardive dyskinesia, which means that some part of your body uh goes into the tremors yeah and mine 
went into my eyelids. It practically ruined my life because I would go around blinking out of control all the time. And the, there's no cure for that either. And the answer was to get 10 Botox shots around my eyes every three months. So it's controlled, but not gone. Right. Now, one thing that never happened to me was I never gained weight. Uh, I see people who gain 40, 50, 60 pounds of weight. And uh, then they have to decide, am I going to continue to take the medication or is it too worrying for me to be heavy? I would say most of them don't continue on the medication, which even if it was helping, helping them, they make their own choice to be thin, thinner. Right. They, they would have to change it. Um, so, wow. So there are many side effects, as we already know, uh, so many of us with any kind of medications anyway. But for some people, I know it's, um, I can, in your case, it seems like it has to be that way. And I was just wondering if, um, like, I, I think in my case, I would be very open about trying different um, medications, even natural, something natural, because there's so much of the same effects of these medications that we can find in nature. So there's a lot of natural medicine, especially these days, that um, can be tried, that we can try. But I do understand that you chose not to, right, Steve, not to try something different, something uh, with less side effects. Again, it was in the 70s and yeah. 60s. And no one, no one ever even gave me the idea to take any supplements. Right. So I never have. Right. Uh, I will be honest with you. In my groups, some people take the supplements and so on. And a few people feel better. But I haven't seen where it is this monumental breakthrough. Yes. So I have no no knowledge about uh, supplements or anything like that. Yes. Um, so we're almost at the end. I, I would like to know a little bit more about the groups that you facilitate. What is the approach, conversations? Talk to me about what is done and if you are open to new people. I know you're in Phoenix, so that would be an invitation to them. Yes. Um, I meet on Tuesdays and Thursday evenings for two hours and I'm open to any type of mental illness. Yeah. It is through a larger group called COPA here in Phoenix. It isn't nationwide. Anybody can join. I can manage very well 15, 16 people per session. And I usually hit that. Um, anybody, as I said, can enter. But I tell you, the best thing for them to do if they're not in Phoenix is just go to their, the, uh, the computer and look up mental health support groups. And then they'll find them in their area specifically. If they live in Columbus, Ohio, they can find the ones that are around Columbus, Ohio, or New York City, wherever. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons I say that is I'm three hours behind everybody. So if you tune into mine, yeah. it's 10 o'clock at night. So yeah, that's, that's not true. good. Um, but the support groups, as I said, are for everybody. Age, you have to be 18. There are special support groups that are for younger people because they have different problems. Yes. Uh, one of the things that I found out, I've been doing my my groups for eight years now. One of the things I found out was that a high percentage of them got into these mental problems because they were abused yeah. uh, sexually, physically, mentally. Uh, more often than not as a child. And I've also found out that it's unlikely most of the time that it's going to be a stranger that most of the time it was a family member or a good friend of the family or someone they trusted and that person then took away their lives 
Right. Uh, uh, I have people in my groups from 18 to 75, like me. And we, I, because every support group facilitator is different in the way he handles his group. I allow everybody to talk. I pick them out randomly, not in order. I don't want them to prepare for an answer. I want them to answer what I'm calling. And uh, a lot of the times they start out and they're nervous, scared. They don't want anybody to know what's happening. Yeah. And we just talk around the periphery. We get the diagnosis, uh, medications, and so on. And they'll tell us a little bit about what they're going through. But they're really pretty restrained the first couple of times. In many cases, sooner or later, they will let us know what they've been going through. Is that the goal for them to open up and start talking? Well, for many of them, again, we'll get back to the mental health system. They have no other place to vent. Mm, true. Uh, when they get comfortable with us, they talk about it. And then the nice thing about my groups, everybody has been through similar things. So they call my group comfort them and they'll find out that they're people who've gone through the same thing and they will become good friends and help help each other out yes yeah and then we talk about uh, treatments and we i never tell anybody oh i did really well on lithium so you should take lithium because none of the drugs work for everybody. Yes, yeah, true. You find the one specifically good for you. So we talk about that. And I would say out of the, let's say I have 15 members at a meeting, 10 of them will be regulars. And then the rest will be filled up with, with uh, people who are new. Now, one of the problems is a lot of the times they join the group one time and then never come back. Uh, yeah. And that's something I would like to change, but I can't. It's up to them. They make excuses. Uh, they don't like what somebody says. That's a big deal. Uh, uh, yeah. Because people in the group are not trained about what they can say and what they can't say because it might trigger somebody else. If somebody says something, they don't mean anything by it, but a new person will take it as, hell, I'm not coming back if they're going to talk on that. And a lot of people don't believe in medications. So if we talk too much about the good of medications, they won't come back. So it's it's pretty precarious situation I get myself into in each one of these groups. No, not allowed to. Oh, you know. No taboo. And we never do. Yeah, there'll be a taboo thing. Okay. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. What I see is, is that how we human beings, a lot of times we're very close to uh, not what's wrong with us, but how can we live a better life, so happier, more peaceful? I, I think being open is very important. That's crucial. To just be open although i'm not open to tv i don't watch the news <laughs> that's one thing i don't do yeah. it. <laughs> but i love being open to everything well one thing i got to throw out here i i do want to talk yeah. about this before i go uh the stigma against mental health is still here still as strong as ever people w have often said when i'm kind of down Pick a walk or go to a movie. That'll help you. Well, that just makes it worse. So somehow in this country, we've got to change the way people look at mental illness. Yeah. 
people are, who have mental illness are not crazy or going to do something terrible to you. 99% of them with mental illness are going to be fine. And for all of the talk we have about the shootings going on around the country, trying to blame it on mental health, nothing could be further from the truth. Ah. What is that gun control department? <laughs> That's what we need more, right? That's a joke. I, yeah, I don't understand what kids are doing with guns. Doesn't make sense, any sense. Yeah, that's a big one. That's a big, a, a really important message about yeah. mental health and being open to work with it ourselves and also as as a system, as a country. We're almost at the end. I do have the ending questions here for you, Steve. I love the dedication in your book. <laughs> that's for your wife, Lenny. That's yes. beautiful. I, Thank I, you. Yeah, just have it here. I read it like two times. I'm like, oh, that's that shows his gratitude. And... Um, to end the conversation, I have uh, two questions. Would you like to read a passage in your book? Do you have your book in front of you? If you, if you I, wanna, I do. Yeah, if you want to read to a passage. Wife? Yeah, I'm sorry? The passage to my wife? No, actually any passage, anything that you want to read in from the book, anything. Yes. It's the first page, chapter one, yes. the horror of it. Yeah. When I was a fun... Loving kid of nine, I never dreamed I would face the most terrifying day of my life in a matter of months. One of my first child memories was from the time when my best friend Stocks and I were rambling along a wooded area near my home, minding our own business, when suddenly we spotted a shed. Venturing into it, we discovered shovels, tools, gardening supplies. Above our heads was a glass ceiling divided into panes much like a greenhouse. It was fortuitous for us that one of the panes was missing. We could climb through the opening and slide down the slanted roof into the newly fallen snow. As an ultra thin scrawny 50 pounder, I went first during my exit, I actually broke one of the panes sending shards of glass in all directions. Without further incident, I made it to the roof. My buddy was a heavy set kid and tried to wiggle through the openings, but couldn't make it. As he fell to the floor, he spied a hammer. He hoisted himself up to the glass, broke the remaining pane, and carried onto the roof. We both slid down the roof and then headed toward the woods. Out of nowhere, we heard a loud woman's voice yelling, Stop! What are you hoodlums doing? What are your names? At that moment, I had a great idea of how we could escape. Tell her you're me, Stocks, and I'll tell her I'm you. She'll never figure out who we are. So we did, and then ran into the woods, howling with laughter all the way home. Yes, we later had been caught, and yes, we were punished. Our parents also had to pay for the broken glass. But honestly, we were just two normal nine-year-olds having fun. That's how I felt back then, a normal kid. For a time, all was right in my world until that horrific day at the movie theater. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you so much again, Steve. Um, it's yes. truly, truly beautiful to see you sharing the story and doing what you do to help others. It's uh, something that's very close to my heart. I believe my spirituality has to do with the interconnectedness of everything. I believe we're all connected. We're all God. So we are doing the best that we can with the, the body mind that we have in order to realize that beautiful, kind nature of God. And one day, perhaps all of us can walk this earth um, with a smile on our face and kind of an acceptance of the body as it is that will end one day. But we, at least we, are, we had fun in that sense of being healthy <laughs> and peaceful. Uh, I do. It's not a belief system. It's really something that's from my heart. For some, for some reason, that's what my path is. Good. So I want to thank you. And I do have a, a last question. So the best place to find you in your book, that would be authorstevewilson.com or there's another yes. place. Yes, that's my website. Okay, so I'll have the Amazon link to your book as well. My final question is, what is your idea of freedom? What is to be free? 
Ooh, never thought of that. Yeah. But I, I really think you can't be free unless you have control of your own mind. Mm. Mm. If, if you're suffering from mental illness, all of a sudden you're a captive and you spend your life trying to get better and that is not freedom. And you know what? I don't think most people ever attain freedom. I think if you really looked at it, the statistics of 20% are way low. I think that people all over the world can get caught up in what their life is like and really fall trapped to their own mind. Mm -hmm. And then you got all the other things against freedom. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's just political stuff. So I guess that's what I feel about it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's beautiful. I love the way you said that too. Uh, I would, from my perspective, I would change the word control is understanding the mind. I think trying to control the mind, it will never happen. Like you said too, we can never be free from that. The mind is just does what it does. Yes. So yeah, that's why my practice of meditation to see the movements of mind and ignoring a lot of it. <laughs> a lot of them is not really useful anyway. So that kept me very healthy mentally. But I want to thank you again for your presence thank in this you reality. And we'll talk soon. Bye for now, Stephen. Okay. Take good care of yourself, my dear. You too. Thank you.